let's follow another trail. Uh, along comes uh, companies, let's take uh, like Boeing, and I don't know if you've heard this story, but it's a very common story. The uh, documentation for the 747 required a 747 to carry it around. That's how much documentation there was. Imagine trying to use Microsoft Word to create all of the documentation for a Boeing 747 be very, very difficult, almost impossible to do because it's so complicated and it's so interconnected and it has to be done more like a database really than like a word processing file. But yet it still has to have all this markup. It still has to be um, structurally and, uh, well, it still has to be marked up with format and it still has to be structurally marked up. So what to do? A new language was invented that, that focused instead of, in, instead of like the WYSIWYG word processor languages, really focused on giving information structural tagging much more than formatting tagging. Really the large majority, 99, well maybe not 99, 95% of the markup in word processors is for formatting. It's to make it look a particular way. That was really the job that people took on. But now when you get into the documentation sets for very large organizations like a Boeing or the Department of Defense or someone like that, you have to have structural markup because it's much more important for the Boeing documentation for the engineers to know what a piece of information is about, what it applies to, which part it applies to, um, which manufacturer it was, all of this data-like stuff, than it is for them to know what it looked like. And furthermore, they realized very, very quickly that if I knew that it was the manufacturer of a particular part, well, it was easy enough to put the manufacturer's name on the house, and that's what I chose to do. So, they invented a language called FTML, and FTML, called the Standard Generalized Markup Language, was a language that allowed more or less engineers and technical documentation specialists to create very large databases of documentation to specify what things are inside of that documentation rather than what they look like. But what's interesting about SGML is it's a general language, the generalized markup language. It's able to represent anything you want it to including, if you chose, to get rid of its, its, its uh, original idea of specifying the, the structure of information, and instead have it specify the formatting of information. Enter HTML. When the web was invented, or not, yeah, pretty much when the web was invented, and hypertext markup language, HTML came along with it for representing information on a web page. The authors of HTML had to figure out how are we going to do markup. Will we use dot B on one side and close dot B on the other side, the way that um, uh, the way that word processors did it? Will we try to have a WYSIWYG environment? That option, the WYSIWYG environment, was thrown out almost immediately because they didn't have the tools. When the web was invented, it was a very shoestring operation. And so whatever had to happen had to happen in text. And so the choice they made right off the bat was to go back to the days when markup was completely visible rather than try and make their markup um, uh, underground and have lots of application interface between you and the markup. So it was text-based markup. And they looked around what's a really good text-based markup language and they saw SGML. Furthermore, they saw that SGML allows you to define whatever tags you want. Finally, they realized that SGML will allow you to even define formatting tags that have nothing to do with the structure of the information. And that was the birth of, S of HTML. HTML is a derivative. It's a, a, an, an instantiation, a schema, a DTD, if you like, of SGML. It's a version of SGML, and that's why SGML tagging and HTML tagging look exactly the same. If you look at an SGML document, and you say, by, that, by God, that looks really familiar. All of those tags are the same. I got the angle brackets, I got the quotes, all the attributes inside the tag, et cetera, et cetera. It all looks very familiar, except I don't really understand the tag names. The reason you don't understand the tag names is because it's using a different, we'll call it later a namespace. Let's call it right now just a, a set of tags, a different tag set. The, SGML, the tag set that you would see in HTML is different than the tag set you might see in some other SGML document because the other SGML document is using a different set of tags, a different set of names. So that takes us to HTML, and HTML allows the web to explode. Why does HTML allow the web to explode? Because HTML is really easy. HTML is really lax. It only, when, it's, when it launched, it had a, a, a so, so few tags that you could put them all on one page, and you could learn all those tags in just a few hours, and you can make a web page display almost immediately. That allowed it to explode. It also allowed it to explode because it focused on format, not on structure. Everybody understands format. You understood format before you walked in the room. You may struggle to understand structure after you've left this course. So, 
the the reason HTML exploded, the reason it was it was uh, it was a very good choice for making the web uh, a common thing that anyone could use, is because it's simple, very few tags, or at least it started out simple with very few tags, and the tags focused on formatting. People could understand that when they wanted something to be bold, they would use a B tag. Now, notwithstanding the fact that HTML itself has some obscure tag names, um, by and large, it's pretty well decodable and it's pretty easy to learn. So that's HTML. Now, what happened to HTML over this, over this period while HTML was going ballistic? Everybody loved HTML. Everybody wanted to be an HTML person. HTML became really cool. But meanwhile, its parent, its much more powerful parent, HTML, withered. It went away. It was considered to be too difficult to use. You had to go through this whole process of creating uh, tag names and, and, uh, and it just, unless you had a very big project with lots and lots of documents in it or lots of documentation, it was considered just too bulky and, and hard to use. So HTML went away. HTML withered. And I wouldn't say go, went away exactly. Its use never took off. It never became the standard that everyone would have liked it to become, except Round about, oh, uh, well, I don't want to say what date it is because I don't have that right in front of me. Let's say late 90s-ish. The web is really now in full bloom. It's starting to explode, and people are realizing that that simple language of HTML really isn't sufficient for representing all the things we need in order to create web pages. Why? Because it's only formatting. And oftentimes, we need to represent things structurally. Meanwhile, there's all these other uses for structured information that are becoming apparent. Like, for example, data transport between, between database applications and configuration and all those things that require a sophisticated structural markup, not a formatting markup. So what happens to SGML? It does what a lot of old and decrepit institutions do, change this name, put an X in its name. Now, instead of SGML, it was XML. And literally, that was just about all that happened. They added some data types. They made it a little bit more amenable for programmers to use it to, to, to make serialization. But by and large, what happened was it changed its name from HTML to XML. So everything that you know, everything that you learn about XML, let's say 95% of it is going to be back propagatable to HTML. It's going to give you what you need in order to understand HTML. So XML came on the scene, um, let's call it late 90s and has remained on the scene as an alternative to HTML when you need structure instead of just the format of, of information. And also for the other uses that I've talked about in, in the lecture on the uses of XML for serialization and data transfer, etc. So let's review that history of markup. It started literally as marks on a piece of paper. And those marks on the piece of paper have everything you need to know what markup is all about. Markup surrounds the information that it's meant to describe. It describes that information. It's really metadata. They're, they're tags that put metadata around the information that we're trying to describe. There's formatting metadata, formatting markup. And formatting markup is really easy to use, but it only goes so far in giving you full-featured information that has the ability to uh, be used in many places and to be programmatically manipulated. Structural tagging, on the other hand. And you can see right from the start that there's formatting and structural um, tagging. The formatting tr uh, tagging really has reached kind of an apex in HTML, but also in word processors. Word processors are extremely sophisticated markup engines. And the structural markup has really reached its apex through HTML. And HTML and XML are both derivatives of SGML. XML, uh, XML inherits all the abilities of SGML. And HTML really is just one tag set, one set of tags that you can use SGML to, 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 uh, to create that describes the formatting or the look and feel of documents.